Good afternoon. My name is Morgan E. Freeman, and I'm one of the co-curators uh, of This Land, American Engagement with the Natural World. Thank you for joining us for our second panel of the day, Reframing Collections, Practices, and Care. Uh, I have to say it's very exciting for me to be back here in person at the Hood Museum uh, with my colleagues, and such a thrill to be able to see the fruits of our labor, so to speak, um, hanging up in the galleries. This Land uh, is an exhibition that was only possible uh, with a deeply collaborative curatorial and exhibitions team. Working exclusively within the Hood's permanent collections required our unique respective areas of expertise in combing through its holdings, collections that are for the most part thought of as distinct and existing in context divorced from one another. Pulling back the, the curtain of these enforced boundaries allowed for the telling of a broader narrative that acknowledges the multitude of actors involved in the intricacies of trade, changing ecologies, and labor relations, to name a few examples. To speak to a specific moment uh, in curating the section of the exhibition titled Force of Nature, we found ourselves drawn to photographic work that documented or engaged with the potential of uh, natural disasters. Sitting with these photographs, we noticed a kind of passivity that failed to recognize strategic efforts under settler, settler colonial logic that weaponized elements of nature to harm and disrupt relationships to place. And I'm already seeing so many resonance here um, between this, this panel and um, the, our, our first panel of the day. Um, how did those actions then ignite migratory movement in response? How are our relationships to the outdoors shaped generationally as a result of this violence? After many conversations, these questions led us to the acquisition of Ken Gonzalez Day's Nightfall One, which is part of a larger body of work titled Searching for California Hang Trees, a speculative and documentary exercise to recover the history of lynching in the state of California, which often goes un unacknowledged. We were asking ourselves if we were to acquire a work uh, on the horror of 19th and 20th century American lynching in our present moment, what must the work accomplish? Keeping in mind that the museum's environmental photography collection is heavily engaged with by students and professors alike, we found it necessary for such a work to refrain from explicitly depicting uh, this traumatic history. And I'm seeing this example in conversation with uh, the matter of art and racial uh, violence that Janet and Alyssa spoke about during our first panel. The power of Gonzales Day's Nightfall One, which I invite you all to spend time with upstairs, it's a deeply meditative work, lies in, instead within its commitment to bear witness while simultaneously refusing to reproduce images of bodily harm, specifically against black and brown peoples. It would be naive to think that any one collection shaped by trends, uh, donor gifts, and shifting curatorial interests could tell a complete succinct story of the nation state that we're situated in uh, within the imposed borders of today. I had a supervisor say to me the other day that rather than assuming that a museum is equipped to display an object simply because it exists within their collections, we should instead be in the habit of beginning with the question, what, if anything, puts us in a position to be ill-equipped to tell the story? She continued by urging that we operate under a framework uh, in which to collect and to display is always a privilege rather than a right. I'd like to now open it up to our wonderful panelists who will together explore the responsibility and challenges involved in shaping institutional collections practices. Mindy Visa, Anya Montiel, Leila Bermio, and Royce Young Wolf. And I invite you to um, read their respective bios for more information. Um, Mary Coffey, professor of art history and affiliated professor with Latin American, Latino, and Caribbean studies uh, program at Dartmouth will join us in moderating our panel discussion. So I would like to open it up to Mindy to start us off. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you all for uh, coming back after lunch. That's always an important thing. Um, I also want to uh, thank Jamie and Michael for inviting me here today. There we go. 
Uh, for those of you who have not yet been to Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art, you heard a little bit about it this morning, but in case you don't know, it is located in Bentonville, Arkansas. And at, in Bentonville, we thank the Caddo, Quapaw, and Osage, and the caretakers of the land and water where Crystal Bridges now sits. So in, just in case someone was thinking, Crystal Bridges, I know where Peabody Essex Museum is, but I have just have never heard of Crystal Bridges. Just wanted to give you that little plug. So I am using Neri Ward's We the People to inspire my own considerations and thoughts for the ways to present and collect a more complex, nuanced, and interdisciplinary approach to American art. In Neri Ward's monumental piece, this is 27 feet wide, the words and letters come in and out of focus. This destabilizes we, people. The shoestrings that make up the piece can be fuzzy, messy. They can even go missing and then come back. This messiness and complexity, I believe, should be reframing collecting practices and care. I've divided my remarks today into two parts. So the first part, I wanna really zoom through some of the programs and other ways that we have displayed our collection as a way to frame how we can reckon with and reframe our collecting practices from here moving forward. Uh, the first section I have called learning, and probably more accurately, unlearning. When Crystal Bridges first opened in 2011, we were a museum anxious to build a reputation and show the world that we should be taken seriously as an American art museum. In essence, we denied our location in Bentonville, Arkansas, and collected and presented canonical American art, paintings, sculptures, works on paper from the colonial era to the present. I identify with this. I'm trained as an Americanist. I have a PhD in American art history. We can talk later about what that means. And I have 20 years experience working with American art, largely before the 1960s, which is what I oversee at Crystal Bridges. In 2018, I did lead a team to reinstall our collections. In that reinstallation, it forced us to take a very strong look at what we were missing. How could we unlearn, let go of the canon, throw it out, start to see questions, start to see it as stories? We didn't need uh, necessarily a chronology, although I will say the chronology is very hard to undo. It is still remaining with us. We wanted to remove the simplified um, version and get to something more complex. Actually, I'm gonna go back for one second. So visitors today come into the collection galleries. They're greeted by We the People, by Neri Ward, and also portraits by artists from a variety of different backgrounds and spanning the time period of the collection. And this is intentional to act as an introduction to our visitors of the scope of our collection, but also to telegraph the wide variety in our collection. Uh, one of the other keys that we have engaged with, and I heard this actively in the morning panel, was collaboration. So what does it mean to show your work and be inspired by stakeholder conversations and conversations, in this case in 2018, it was the first time Crystal Bridges had engaged um, indigenous community members to talk with us about the best ways of displaying the work. Now, what you will see is um, Native American art in conversation with the American collection. To Karen's point earlier, um, I would say this was probably less than 1% of the total objects on view. But how I want to convey this in the subject of this panel is, what do you do when your collection doesn't have the stories you want to tell? Relying on loans, oh man, it's tough. It is expensive and you're you know, really acquiring and relying on expertise from others as well. Um, so in hindsight, I would say this, what I might call an intervention model of inserting, including, integrating additional collections 
still is very much a colonial approach. What happens when we step out of an early American space into a contemporary art um, gallery, for example? In this sense, a shared visual vocabulary really brings the works into conversation more seamlessly, unapologetically. Um, and I really specifically highlighted Diani Whitehawk and Frank Big Bear. Um, but I do want to also point to where museums, systems, and structures in my opinion, are not yet fully quite set up to recognize and highlight multiplicities of identity. We talk about labels. That question was brought up earlier. At Crystal Bridges in our collection galleries, we only do birth date, death date. Now, by not including information, are we subsuming and flattening identities? By assuming someone is American, what actually is that projecting? Um, perhaps even whiteness. When we identify races such as African American or nationalities such as Lakota, um, we don't actually call out on Ellsworth Kelly's label that he's white. So where are these inequities? In our data structures, in our museum database, we don't you know, categorize or capture everything. So do we go back and reevaluate every single collection record? I would actually say yes. Yes, we do. This is the work that has to be done in order to celebrate and change collections, hold ourselves accountable, but also to present to audiences. So wh what's missing for audiences? And we can certainly come back to that later. So Austin uh, pointed out Art for a New Understanding. Exhibitions for us have been excellent ways to introduce audiences to subjects in a deeper way and also set us up for some great acquisitions. So we already had that highlighted. The other thing I wanted to say is ex exhibitions have helped me learn and unlearn, especially unlearn. I had the great pleasure of being a co-curator on this project with Candace Hopkins and Manuela Welloffman. I jumped in enthusiastically and naively. After all, I had used Kent Monkman as a centerpiece in a chapter of my dissertation, his delightful play on Albert Bierstadt and Thomas Aikens. I understood Aikens and Bierstadt, and I thought, oh, this is just great. I can leap over this. Um, well, I had a lot to unlearn and learn. It was not just about artists and scholars that were new to me, but it was about the long-term impact for me really came from processes, missteps, redirections along the way. So if Crystal Bridges started by collecting canonical American art and denying our place, this exhibition was one of those, you hit the bumpers, we had to redirect. It was important to engage and support indigenous voices with this exhibition, but what we didn't think about and what we learned, it was really important to make sure our place was recognized. Indigenous community members from this place, well, from Arkansas, not this place, from our Arkansas place had to be involved, had to be valued, had to be collaborators. That was one of our key learnings. In another mini, little mini focus exhibition, we did use um, acquisitions to experiment and present works a little differently. So taking inspiration from Marie Watt, collaborating with the Museum of Native American History, and I co-curated this small show, show with Ashley Holland, who has deep knowledge of contemporary Native American art. Um, we put objects in dialogue more 50-50 if we're going to go down to the percentages of native and non-native artists. In fact, there were more native artists than non-native artists. I feel like we need to swing the other direction to find that place where the pendulum settles. And in this, using Marie Watts' um, thinking and teaching of reciprocity, storytelling, where the delineations between animals, humans, nature were all in relation. How could we use that to guide how American art and, not, and na Native American and non-Native American art work together. Some of my favorite pairings here, 
Norman Akers and Dorothea Tanning. You know, pull it out of the art historical conversation and get to where these objects can speak to one another. I should say this was an exhibition where we did identify if an artist was American or if they were um, Pueblo. So we did uh, identify nations. Um, I think there are many ways to think about approaching exhibitions as well as collecting and using contemporary artists as thought partners is absolutely one more way. We invited Diani Whitehawk to uh, co-curate um, a little section of a celebratory exhibition of Crystal Bridges recently, which I bring in just again to frame where I really want to uh, spend my last five minutes is part two, reckoning. I feel really strongly that we have to reckon with many things that museum systems have done that art history has set up for us. Um, my understanding of American art gets formed and reformed regularly and that uncomfortability has just been a place where the messiness has to happen. So I, in thinking of framing and reframing, and Jamie, thank you for that comment about a frame can be both limiting and refreshing. When it comes to acquisitions, at Crystal Bridges, we have an acquisition fund. It's fairly healthy, it's not unlimited. But with the hiring of Polly Nordstrand, curatorially, we have all agreed that Native American art as dictated by Polly is what's taking priority for our acquisitions this year. And so that acceptance as American art, you know, because we're an American art museum, is really beneficial to acquisition funds in those structures there. I had been really the liaison for Native American art for four years before the hiring of Polly. We made acquisitions at the time. Um, and I'm sure I made a lot of mistakes, I'm positive of it, um, but one of the works that came into the collection was by this Ojibwe artist, a bandolier bag. But I bring in also George DeForest Brush in this conversation because if we are to reckon and tell multiple stories, we have to do it with our uh, white European artists. If this is where the bulk of our collection lies, so instead of simply presenting this painting as an idealized version, look at that figure, academic training, to tell the story of Brush visiting Apache Indians imprisoned at Fort Marion and then painting this image of a pretty mismatched figure in a landscape that's very swampy is something to behold. In the spirit of transparency, of reckoning, I'm going to share with you our collection demographics. Ooh, scary, this is being broadcast. Um, I know you can't read the details and that's not super important. What maybe is a good takeaway is on the top is the total in our collection by race and ethnicity. That light blue there is white. On the bottom is total by gender, 78% male. This is the entire collection. If you break it down even further to the pre-1900 collection, we're at about 91% white. Our collection has changed over time. So this is how our collections have grown in our first decade as a museum, and you can see there's some good movement there at the end. I wanna talk about how we use the data. I used some of this data to point out in a blog for Black History Month last year how much work we had to do. At the time, there were three paintings and one sculpture prior to 1900 by an African-American artist. If you expanded it to 1960, we had a total of 13. That's not very many. Um, and interestingly enough, and something I'd love to wrestle further with you all is how information can be presented, help us be held accountable to justify new acquisitions, for example, but how it can be misconstrued. Our own social media group used the same group of artists to celebrate the black artists in our collection, and they should be celebrated. But the overarching thrust of we need to do more got lost in that reinterpretation of data. So this is how our um, new acquisitions have shifted over time. Um, I want to say that curators can make a difference. We must 
make a difference. Collections are the base for uh, donor cultivation, for audiences, for audiences that are felt, feel don't feel included, for the ways school tours learn history, American art history, for the stories, the programs that we tell. This is really, really important work. It's important work, I, I'm wrapping up, I promise. It's important work in um, new acquisitions that can come into the collection. This is a recent acquisition. Um, Crystal Bridges has outlined our uh, collecting goals. We're focused on art and artists underrepresented in American art history. We're embracing the power of craft, self-taught artists, and Native American art to expand definitions of American art, to challenge so-called fine art hierarchies, and connect with the diversity of American art practices past, present, and future. We aim to build a distinctive American art collection that represents artistic excellence and quality, and also promotes inclusion, belonging, and relevance for broad audiences. So we know uh, it's daunting, in fact. We know from our data points that if we project Say we acquire 50 new artists a year, um, and half of those are racially and ethnic ethnically diverse. In 20 years, guess where our collection will be? Only 35% diverse. Now, we're not collecting 50 new artists a year, so <laughs> this is really daunting, but it's worthwhile, and it can happen, and we can make a difference. So I will end there. Thank you. Let me just flip through all the things I didn't talk about. <laughs> Good afternoon. I would like to thank the organizers for bringing us together and this invitation to speak. I arrived from the West Coast and I am grateful to the Abenaki people on whose land we gather today. My name is Anya Montiel, and I'm a curator at the Smithsonian's National Museum of the American Indian. My talk, Collecting Today for Tomorrow, Crafting a Better World, is about my previous position as the curator of American and Native American arts and crafts at the Smithsonian's Renwick Gallery. I will begin with a brief overview of the Renwick Gallery, which is a branch of the Smithsonian American Art Museum. The building was constructed in the mid-1800s to house William Corcoran's art collection. It then had other uses, but in 1965, President Lyndon Johnson transferred ownership of the building to the Smithsonian. Now named the Renwick Gallery after its architect, the museum opened to the public in 1972 with eight exhibitions highlighting American craft and design. It didn't have a mandate to build a collection, but was envisioned as a museum for rotating exhibits of craft and design. A few works came into the collection anyway, mainly through limited purchases and gifts. In 1981, the Renwick decided to build a collection, and the next year, the nonprofit group, the James Renwick Alliance, was established to support programs and acquisitions of American craft. This year, the Renwick celebrates its 50th year. The museum has followed an expansive definition of American craft. There have been exhibitions highlighting form, function, studio craft, various mediums and eras. In 2015, for example, the Wonder exhibition transformed the museum into an immersive space with nine artists creating large-scale and site-specific installations from unexpected materials. This work is Shindig by Patrick Doherty, a sculptor known for twisting and weaving saplings into organic forms. The visitor response was tremendous, with lines wrapping around the building to experience a sense of wonder. The Renwick is known for being innovative, eclectic, and responsive to the world. In February 2020, I was hired as a curator of American and Native American arts and crafts in a position split between the Renwick Gallery and the National Museum of the American Indian. Immediately, I was to assist with related programming around the Hearts of Our People, Native Women Artists Exhibit organized by the Minneapolis Institute of Art, 
the exhibit showed how women have long been the creative force behind Native art and featured more than 115 women artists. The exhibition opened during my first week and closed merely three weeks later due to the COVID-19 pandemic and the exhibition never reopened. During the early days of the pandemic, I was a curator without access to the museum's collection, archives, or library. We worked from home, delivering what online content we could, such as Zoom talks with artists, blog posts, and art presentations. One thing we could do is plan for the future and acquire more works for the collection. Together with Nora Atkinson, the Renwick Curator at Large, and Mary Savig, the Sherman Curator of Craft, we thought about how to document the current moment. We were guided both by the museum's vision of, it's known as celebrating makers, taking both innovative and time-honored approaches to their work, as well as the announcement by Secretary of the Interior, Lonnie Bunch, that the job of a museum is not just to look back, it is, collect to, it is to collect today for tomorrow. We began collecting face masks created by artists, including this one by local Korean American artist, Julia Kwan, who made a series of face masks called Unapologetically Asian. She stitched a vibrant patchwork of Korean silk known as Bojagi to honor her heritage during the rise of anti-Asian racism in the United States and to encourage mask wearing. We also acquired a mask by Marlana Thompson, a Mohawk bead artist and regalia maker from Akwesasne. Her Onunkwasuna medicine plants depict strawberries, white pine, and cedar, along with C19 2020 on the right side. The bottom row has three sky domes, which represent prayers for her three children. Thompson explained that the pandemic will force many people to seek out traditional teaching, gardening, and harvesting foods and medicines. We should never forget what has happened, and we should all grow from it. As curators, we decided to collect firsthand accounts of the pandemic from artists working with craft-based materials and techniques. I mentioned that this year marks 50 years of the Renwick Gallery. Next month, the anniversary exhibit, uh, this present moment, actually this is, here we go, wrong order of slides. Uh, I'll get back to that one. So next month, the anniversary exhibit, this present moment, Crafting a Better World, curated by Mary Savig, will open. It features existing works from the collection and many new acquisitions. Curator, and in line with what Mindy did, so curator Nora Atkinson in 2019 conducted an assessment of the Renwick collection. And of the 2,288 works, two thirds of the artists were men. And of those 2,288 works, 94% were artists of European descent only. That does not represent the history of American craft, nor artists working today. In planning for the 50th anniversary, an acquisition campaign was necessary. I mentioned some of the collecting goals that the Renwick has undertaken in the last few years, and through the generosity of an acquisition campaign, contacting past supporters, the Renwick Alliance, Smithsonian Grants, and collectors of American craft across the country. The Renwick has acquired 181 artworks since 2020, with more coming in. We were able to focus on collecting many mediums, artworks working uh, in innovative techniques, and focus on artists of all genders, sexualities, ethnicities, and abilities. Through these acquisitions, we were able to talk about the present moment, visions of the future, global issues, stories of resilience, and activism. I will address the last three points, respect, reciprocity, and responsibility in a bit. I must call attention to this acquisition by Sonia Clark. In 2011, Clark was awarded a Smithsonian Artist Residence Fellowship and spent time in the Smithsonian collections. At American History, she found a plain dishcloth 
What she discovered was the white cloth waved at the Appomattox Courthouse in 1865 to signal the Confederate Army surrender. She wondered, what if this flag of truce was the flag we knew instead of the Confederate battle flag? Like the title, the work is monumental and requires careful care and storage, but it was a work that needed to be at the Renwick, which is steps away from the White House. As curator Nora Atkinson remarked, this work is a metaphor for where we stand as a country. Constructed using historical methods, the dirty white expanse of monumental physically embodies the space racial injustice holds in our collective national subconscious. And as Clark notes, the act of weaving warp and weft itself becomes a powerful metaphor for bringing together two disparate sides to create a stronger fabric. My essay for the 50th anniversary exhibit was to imagine the future. When I wrote the essay a year ago, the coronavirus pandemic was bringing so much sickness and death and nationwide protests reignited calls for social justice and equity. Living in a melancholic and unpredictable time made the future almost seem impossible to imagine. One aspiration was to emerge from this present moment creating spaces and works that are therapeutic and synergistic and kinder. If so, what will American craft look like in the future? More importantly, what should guide the future of craft? American craft and art have their origin stories and locales, but this land has memory, and this continent holds ancient interconnected knowledge systems from indigenous observations of the flora, fauna, and cosmos. Indigenous scholars have articulated indigenous knowledges, worldviews, and methodologies to counter dominant Western paradigms and advance other ways of knowing. I look to indigenous scholars like Cora Weber Pilwax and Sean Wilson for help. And they have what is known as the three R's, respect, reciprocity, and responsibility. They are key features of any healthy relationship and are valuable for non-indigenous people as well. These are principles I put forward that will provide a restorative framework for American craft as shown through these acquisitions, which you can see in the exhibition. Respect centers on being a good relative and descendant. Ancestors struggled and endured so that the succeeding kin might thrive. St. Louis-based artist Basil Kincaid comes from seven generations of quilters and creates quilted paintings that reflect ancestral connections, collective memory, and healing. He remarked that his art is a way to honor my predecessors while addressing the questions and concerns of where I am, where we are today. For Riverside Revival, Lift Every Voice and Sing, Kincaid collected old choir robes from local black churches to construct the central figures with arms extending upwards in praise. He then assembled the multichromatic background from pieces of vintage quilts, donated clothing, and Ghanaian fabric and embroidery. The work offers both personal and collective connections. Kincaid's paternal grandparents met at a church revival, and the power of spirituality and song was ever present in their lives. The subtitle, Lift Every Voice and Sing, pays tribute to the poem turned song by brothers James Weldon Johnson and Charles Rosamund Johnson that became the canonical song of the NAACP and is often referred to as the Black National Anthem. Written over 120 years ago, Lift Every Voice and Sing contains lyrics of hope and strength in the face of injustice. Kincaid's work likewise provides another story of ancestral resilience and respect carried forward. The second principle is reciprocity. Michael Anthony Hart from Fisher River Cree, whose work centers on indigenous knowledges and social work, defines reciprocity as the belief that as we receive from others, we must also offer to others. Reciprocity centers around a mutually beneficial exchange while incorporating the first principle of respect. Aram Han Sifuentes is a Chicago-based artist who practices reciprocity through her art and social action. She learned to sew at a young age to assist her mother's work as a seamstress. 
through sewing Cifuentes, who identifies as an immigrant of color, challenges notions of identity politics, immigration, immigrant labor, possession, dispossession, citizenship, and belonging, dissent, and protest. After her discontent from the 2016 US presidential election results, Cifuentes used her medium to protest and community build. She established the protest banner lending library as a space for people to meet in a sewing circle and make their own banners while acting as a library to check out banners to borrow. The banners carry different messages and phrases like this one, Otro Mundo es Posible, or Another World is Possible, and they're taken to protests, returned, and then used by someone else. The library allows the works to circulate and travel, thereby offering their messages far and wide. By prioritizing reciprocity, Cifuentes' artistic practice is both an offering and generative, benefiting everyone. The final principle, responsibility. Works in concert with respect and reciprocity. Nishabek scholar Leanne Simpson best explains how the three intertwine. Our nationhood is based on the foundational concept that we should give up what we can to support the integrity of our homelands for the coming generations. We should give more than we take. It is a nationhood based on a series of radiating responsibilities. Simpson adds that the re radiating responsibilities reach inward as well as outward. Responsibility is a reminder that all the principles are equally important in building and sustaining relationships. Carla Hemlock, a, a Mohawk textile and multimedia artist from Ganawagi, created a work that exposes a deterioration in responsibility. Entitled Our Destruction, the textile work is a hand applique quilt on black and red wool. On the left, middle, and right sides of the border are the words, our heart, our home, our soul. Inside the border is a vibrant scene of beaded flowers, vines, birds, and dragonflies in the raised Mohawk bead style. The very center holds a pair of sequined ruby red slippers identical to the ones worn by Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz. The toe of one slipper reads tick and the other talk. The tick tock warning repeats echoing in each corner of the quilt. Despite its outward beauty, our destruction speaks to the current state of the planet and global climate change. On the reverse of the quilt, Hemlock writes, our destruction, our natural world is an environmental ticking time bomb on the eve of destruction. Time is running out. Our inaction will soon redefine those ruby red slippers to symbolize no place to call home. The quilt is a shrouded harbinger of what humans cannot lose, our heart, our home, our soul, looking towards a daily practice that engages body, spirit, and mind to acknowledge the interconnectedness of all beings or respect, create mutually beneficial offerings or reciprocity, and be accountable to these intertwining relationships or responsibility can bring life to Hemlock's premonition. By centering and prioritizing these indigenous worldviews and ways of knowing, American craft has a framework to imagine a future that benefits the community and every being, one with respect, reciprocity, and responsibility joined together in a network that sustains and nurtures at each step. Simpson proposes that to survive and flourish the next 400 years, we need to join together in a rebellion of love, persistence, commitment, and profound caring and create constellations of co-resistance. Such a plan ahead connects all being and holds up the world. Thank you. Thank you all so much. I'm so honored to be here with all of these brilliant colleagues like Mindy and Anya and all of the other speakers and also with all of you joining the conversation. So I'd like to thank our organizers here at The Hood um, and also just acknowledge the Abenaki uh, homelands that we're on today. So when we say American art at the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, we mean that, oh, this is a different talk. Oh, I, we are switched around. Do you, um, <laughs> you want to? <laughs> um, what do you think? Do you want to? Oh, do you want to go, Royce? Or okay, okay, go ahead. I'm. 
kind of segues into how fluid this work <laughs> is, and we need to be um, flexible. So let me back this up for you. Okay, so let's begin again. Um, oops, let me make sure I start this really quick. Okay. Right, so Dojazi meets Gereshtabakish. Thank you so much for being here with me. Thank you to the organizers for inviting me and opening up this space and platform to share the wonderful voices and bright minds that you've been able to witness and listen to. Um, I also want to give thanks to the Abenaki peoples, the ancestors that were here, the ancestors um, yet to come. Um, may they continue to guide us, and may we become one of those ancestors that we, we are looked to for our knowledge um, and our voices. Um, I also want to welcome you all to share this journey with me in seeking, oops, I gotta go ahead, seeking and understanding eliciting contextual meanings and needs from ancestral materials and works. My position, my self in relation to the works is first and foremost, I'm an indigenous woman. I'm an indigenous mother. I also have a very lengthy, long background in um, a traditional upbringing with my elders, with other makers practitioners, language activists, survivals, um, survivors of boarding schools and residential schools. I myself am a fourth generation residential school survivor. Um, I tell myself that I was traditionally trained in the arts at the St. LeBray Indian Catholic Boarding School in Montana for seven years. Um, I had a wealth of knowledge in performing arts, every type of arts, and I took that forward into the work that I do today um, with reinterpreting our ancestral materials, many that were lost, taken, or forgotten at boarding schools. Um, I also want to give warning to anyone who has tribal relations with the Great Plains area that I will be showing some of our ancestral materials, a warrior shirt and ledger work um, that talk about this displacement, this theft of land, and um, items of our ancestors. Following our traditional introductions, again, I want to tell you Doshati Mabitsikits meets Gerishtawakish Nirishi Royskle Yangwo. On my matrilineal side, I'm Sosribia, an Eastern Shoshone woman with ancestral connections to my Nimanab, Benedeka, Comanche Honey Eaters band relatives. On my patrilineal side, I'm a Haratza Kinuita Bia, which, if we focus on my background of linguistics and language work, we have to understand much is lost in translation, especially between sister tribes and relatives. Bia is both Shoshone word for woman and the Apsalage word for woman. In Haratza, Bia is actually the word for fart. <laughs> Instead, we would say, I would say, Haratza he nuetta wia. I am an Apsalage, Haratza, nuetta woman, ancestral ties to um, Apsalage Crow. Also on my paternal side, I'm a me itichukats, he, um, a pukuwiga raga. I'm a member of the Wide Ridge, Wide Ridge Clan and a child of the Low Cap Clan. This information about myself empowers me in the work that I do. It situates me and grounds me in a place and time um, that's deeply connected to my ancestors. And it also provides a weight of responsibility on my shoulders that when I enter these spaces and talk about our ancestral materials, 
I'm also carrying my ancestors with me. I'm carrying the voices that we lost at the boarding schools. I'm carrying the voices that we lost to smallpox, to the epidemics, to colonial genocide, to femicide. I'm carrying the voices that are still being discovered, the ones that we're unveiling through this work. I was invited by Jamie Powell to discuss this concept of reframing collections in care. That's, it's a loaded concept. It is so broad. It is immersive. It is fluid. It can go in every which way possible with the work that I'm doing myself. How could I situate that within a decolonization process? How could I situate that into what is necessary and what is a realistic application? What work would I try to promote and show? Um, what work do I think needs to be prioritized? All of these I am biased in because I'm Haradza, I'm Sosli, I'm my grandmother's daughter, or granddaughter, my mother's daughter. The next is I pose to myself, what's the type of meaning making that I want to happen in the broader sense? What is the meaning making that I hope that each one of you will take away from here? You will integrate into your work. How can I contribute to these brief 15 moments, 15 minutes, the moments that we have together? Reframing collections and care through meaningful indigenous methodologies, trusting the process and appreciating the challenge. Part of this process, the big elephant in the room is access. How do we access these materials that we have been separated from for generations? How do we access these materials where often we can't afford to get to these institutions unless we are in higher education, uh, educational institutions, or we have fellowships or jobs outside of our res reservation and First Nation treaty territories? Next, what, my, what are my goals with this reframing? Foremost, I really wanted to empower our ancestral makers and contemporary knowledge keepers. I wanted to show the interconnectivity, the way that we can talk to each other, have a dialogue across space and time. The materials in these collections are alive. We simply have to teach ourselves and learn how to listen to them, and then how to reiterate and translate their meanings. Next, how do I empower practitioners with skills and confidence to go about this work? Prioritize context-based assessments, provenance research, culturally-based treatment plans, representation, respectful access. These are all of the, the themes and the spaces and the key goals that I deal with every day. And it's my honor to deal with those and unpack them and see what ways I can reframe them and create different methodologies. Next is understanding that the application of indigenous methodologies in any field of study is about relationship work. It's about kinship. This work is also about understanding how fluid these spaces across time are. Often the collection space is prioritized above the self. It's prioritized above the items themselves. Shifting the balance. How can we go about doing this when collections are so broad and we have unique individuals and cultures? Complex multivocal knowledge, interdisciplinary, mul a multiplicity of unique cultural frameworks. Reframing collections through an awareness of care and through an awareness of indigenous methodologies, the process of prioritizing intentions, self, collections, stewardship, respectful access, and representation. Prioritizing self in relation, a concept Margaret Kovac with indigenous methodologies unpacks and discusses in what ways are we self in relation? How are we related to the items on which we are assessing, analyzing, and representing? Locating our knowledge, responsibilities, and intentions, 
means studying and, and experiencing indigenous methodologies and practices. In practice, has equipped me with the vocabulary to describe the visceral experiences I have when I'm amongst ancestral collections. How do I explain what I can feel in the depths of my bones? How do I explain entering a room and knowing these items brought medicine, they brought ceremony to individuals that I am still learning to understand? Indigenous methodologies can be looked at and integrated into this reframing process through self in relation and relationship making, which is also relationship remaking. Next is putting that into practice and collections, context-based meaning making, integrating that unique history and culture into provenance research and applying it in whatever ways possible. To do this, I draw upon interdis interdisciplinary and multicultural bodies of knowledge, bright minds who weave paths across gaps in my own knowledge. These voices highlight the importance of self-location, knowing ourselves and the roots of our knowledge, purpose and intentions. Some of the scholars that I draw upon throughout this work is Mar Margaret Kovac, Self-location anchors knowledge with experiences and then these experiences greatly influence interpretations. Next is Brandy Nalani McDougall. The connectivity inherent in Kauna demands that we find the pathways between contemporary knowledge and the knowledge of our ancestors. Kauna is hidden meanings, the process un unveiling that knowledge. It also is a responsibility to understand how this type of work, we need to prioritize self-care. We need to understand how we are impacted in this process of accessing collections. Not always are opina, which are fishing nets, um, used to catch fish. Sometimes we become caught and caged in opina. We need to respect the relationships that we establish and we hope to create. So self in relation, locating our knowledge, responsibilities, and intentions. Every single item in the collections were made by these hands. They were made by hands that are weathered. They were made by hands that are still aging. How do we empower those makers, particularly when many of those makers are victimized? through the ideas of the loss, through the experiences of theft. Accessing this warrior shirt, it's 1880s ancestral item labeled AC682 in the anthropology collection of the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. This is the online representation. This is the intercontextual Analysis, the, this item is in 1880s, ancestral um, muslin cloth ledger work, AC.3662 in the same anthropology collection. This is the online representation. If we continue to look at different works to find comparative um, pieces, we start to weave together a story. What are these meanings, the markings? Because I have two minutes, I'm gonna go a little bit faster. The where, the repair, the hands that crafted each one of these quill work patterns, the interior parts of these, the honor marks. I was privileged to be at one of the first um, condition assessments of this item in nearly a decade, I believe. It had never been opened up. The details of the story, you can still see the man's paint inside of this shirt. What achievements did he have? What were his loves? What were his losses? Who were the hands that made each one of those quill weaves? I took this work on and partnered with Page Baker Photography. We wanted 
to, I wanted to represent these items. Um, can you cue the video? I wanted to represent each one of these items in our homelands where they were made, where the materials were sourced. I went outside of what was asked of me in my exhibit development work. I went outside of what was dreamed in this exhibit work, that we could situate our ancestral items with the actual um, land bases and sources of that. So in that video that I guess is not playing, um, it shows the riverways, the river bottoms where those items would have been used, the traditional villages. Um, it also showed a, a body, which is porcupine. So I'm gonna skip ahead. Can you see if this one will play, please? Nope. All right. Well, we'll have to do this at a later time then, and I'll describe what it is. So I partnered with Paige Baker Photography, who is an incredible photographer. More than that, he knows the land. He knows our homelands. Um, he is also a chushka. He's one of the people that survived in our last traditional um, Hiradza villages, Hoshka Awadish. This earth lodge is at the Knife River, um, five villages, a national park site. And he was just crazy enough to be out there in the winter time doing astrophotography so that we could capture all of our constellations in the same locations above our traditional earth lodges that our people would look upon and be able to tell those same stories while we're crafting our materials. Understanding the importance of landscape, where those materials are sourced, where those items thrived, and where the makers come from is just as important as the items itself. Even into the future, it inspires us to take care of those lands. With Page Baker Photography, we are the number two in the nation to ever be approved outside of the National Park Service staff to do drone photography, videography, over a national park site at our traditional village, Hoshkawa Dish, which is what the drone footage would have shown on here. Um, we got to see where our last traditional Earth Lodge village was. We got to see the fort, the reconstructed fort, where on that village site, um, it's called Fort Union. We got to document that two Hoshkas, two descendants, recontextualizing these items across the land. Um, and I look forward to the works I'll do in the future where maybe you'll be able to see <laughs> that drone photography and videography. Um, but that's one of the ways that I reframe, that I empower the makers, and um, that I prioritize the contemporary knowledge. So, mazagrats, agatiwasik. I'm back, still thankful, still honored, especially after hearing Roy speak. Thank you so much for, for stepping in. Um, so again, my name is Leila Romeo, and um, I am the curator of paintings at the Museum of Fine Arts Boston. And um, when we say American art at the MFA Boston, we mean that we are responsible for displaying, collecting, and interpreting art, not just from the United States, but also from all of Latin America and Canada, including indigenous and island nations. And this has been true since the opening of the Art of the Americas wing, which you're seeing there on the right, since 2010. But it actually wasn't until 2020 that we had a sign describing any of this work. Um, and or any kind of transparent explanation of how this inclusive hemispheric vision is largely still an unrealized ambition. So when you walk through our galleries, you'll still see that the majority of the works of art on view are by white makers created for elite white collectors. And in the decade before we reinstalled this entry wall, 
visitors were met with an enormous John Singleton Copley portrait of George IV that really has very little to do with the Americas. Like it's not even George III, George III. <laughs> so people are now greeted by uh, two paintings by T.C. Cannon um, that are on long-term loans. So in the sort of wake following on Karen's amazing work with the exhibition at the Peabody Essex Museum. These vibrant works can raise questions about how museums situate some people as collectors and others as the collected, some as visionaries and others as stuck in the distant past. The actions of taking certain works of art down, hanging new objects up, borrowing and buying, are all ways that we are reframing our collection practices at the MFA. But in the wake of working from home for nearly two years during the COVID-19 pandemic, I continue to be really interested in how interpretation, so creating signs like this one that ask, what do we mean by art of the Americas? And who do we describe as an American artist? How can these ways of storytelling, of raising questions, also reorient works of historical American art and better connect the objects in our care with our audiences? In my time today, I would first like to give an overview of different ways we are prioritizing giving more space and visibility to historically marginalized artists, and then focus on a key example from an initiative that we call Translating American Stories, which brings interpretation in multiple languages into our permanent collection galleries for the first time. So the installation of the TC Canning paintings at the entrance to the Art of the Americas wing is part of a larger effort to bring native art out of the basement or beyond our dedicated Native North American gallery, which is located on the lower level of the wing. When the gallery first opened in 2010, it was revolutionary to have indigenous art housed within the same department as the rest of the American collections. But the physical placement of this space, not only downstairs, but all the way in the back, past the Maya and Puritan art, has served to, na to segregate Native works from the rest of art history. And this is to say nothing of the ethnographic style of this installation, which is not repeated in any other gallery. So to shift this presentation of indigenous art, we have since placed ceramics by Lucy Lewis and another Akama Pueblo artist once known in conversation with Jackson Pollock's painting from the same time period. In a gallery filled with famed images of George Washington, visitors now first encounter a Lenape powder horn. The same display case also includes an Anishinaabe war club and a presentation sword from the early 19th century, both described as objects of power and exchange. Although these projects were collated, created collaboratively, exactly who was on our staff made radical differences in the completion of these visions and the awakening of others. These reinstallations were very much shaped by Tess Lukey, a research associate in Art of the Americas between 2019 and 2021, and the first Aquina Wampanoag scholar to work in a curatorial department at the MFA. In addition to advocating for the visibility of works of native art, particularly those from the Eastern Woodlands region, which the museum occupies, Tess also encouraged us to take certain objects off of public view, such as membranes bowls with ties to funerary practices. Here, the mounts are left behind, and a label explains their removal and introduces our visitors to NAGPRA. Sometimes the best way to care for collections is to try to respect the privacy of these objects and the people connected to them. In collecting and displaying historical works of indigenous art, including from communities living in what is now Latin America, we struggle with how the goals of visibility, so of securing the place of indigenous artists within American art history, often conflicts with ethics of collecting, even when objects were not explicitly stolen or coerced from their makers. The great majority of the native art in our collection made before the mid 20th century has not been given to us or purchased from native people. These objects have typically just passed from the hands of one white collector to the next. Involving living indigenous artists in the creation of art specifically for the MFA's collection and collaborating with them on the installation of these objects in our galleries is a relatively new practice for us. One example is the acquisition of our first work of wampum this beaded belt by Elizabeth James Perry, an enrolled member of the Wampanoag tribe of Gay Hedequina, acknowledges the time immemorial history and the continuation of this art form. And it was created in, con in connection with an installation at the museum in summer 2021. In her role as our inaugural curator of Native American art, Chamorro scholar Marina Taikenko has deepened and expanded our collection efforts, putting particular focus on larger scale works that demand space and attention. Mm -hmm. 
the same gallery with the Lenape Powderhorn, the Anishinaabe Club, and Elizabeth James Perry's Wampum also now includes Hanna Degaya's Town Destroyer Whirlwind series, a group of photographs by Mohawk artist Alan Michelson that challenges heroic representations of Washington. This series will be formally acquired later this month, and because Marina is here with us today, hopefully she can share more about this important work and her other projects in our later conversation. Like the acquisitions of works by Elizabeth James Perry and Alan Michelson, our collecting has largely focused on artists who have been historically marginalized in our own galleries. And these efforts will continue. So some recent highlights that uh, works that have been acquired over the last three years include a double portrait by Joshua Johnson, now the earliest painting in our collection by a black artist, an incredibly rare Remedios Faro, the first surrealist painting to enter the MFA. And this particular work enables us to frame the story of surrealism through the work of a woman who worked in Mexico. And an important painting by Norval Morisot, arguably the most influential First Nations painter of the 20th century from what is now Canada. The Varro and the Morisot will be central works in an upcoming reinstallation of our galleries of American modernism. And I am particularly excited about how the Morisot has the power to change the ways that we see objects that are already in our holdings, such as this icon of our collection by Arthur Dove, which you're seeing in the center at the top, or later works by Cuban painter Lolo Soldivia and contemporary sculptor Preston Singletary. There are formal affinities here in the bold contrast of primary colors and the swelling round forms that evoke the shifts of the sun and the moon but also a point to be made about how abstracted representations of plants, water, and changing seasons, so often discussed in relation to white modernists like Dove and Georgia O'Keeffe, have always been part of indigenous histories, religions, and art, and remain urgent subjects of modern and contemporary works. I'd like to now turn away from the discussion of reinstallations and acquisitions and think through the question that we had to ask ourselves when we first began to work from home during the early months of the COVID-19 pandemic. How can we make changes to our galleries without being able to access them? For us, the gallery that we most want to change is also the most challenging to change, a space called Boston on the Eve of Revolution, which includes portraits of historical figures like Paul Revere and Sam Adams. Boston area schools have long centered these objects in their American history curricula, and in the creation of this gallery, there was a great sense of pressure to uphold a traditional narrative about patriots versus Tories. However, the rows and rows of white faces that visitors see when they step into this gallery, which most people experience as the entrance to the art of the America's wing, is definitely not representative of Boston now, but perhaps more interesting is also not representative of Boston around 1775. And here we face the limitations of our collection. And I think this is similar to some of the questions that Mindy raised. How can we represent women, black, and indigenous people from this period if we don't own works of art that they made? And we must confront our own constructions of what constitutes fine art. Here it's largely defined only as oil paintings, high style furniture, and silver made for white colonists. To start to work through these issues and to begin to loosen up this rigid installation, Soon before the pandemic, we took down one of the portraits in this gallery and replaced it with an empty frame with a label asking, who is missing? Who are we not seeing because they were never painted or heroicized in oil on canvas? Crispus Attucks, Phyllis Wheatley, Sekem Solomon, Uhana Una Unmut, also known as King Solomon, are offered as a few examples. But what became most clear to me in writing this label was how much we've overly prioritized portraits in our presentation of art from this period. I wanted to emphasize that these historical figures didn't have portraits made simply because they were too poor, but perhaps also because they came from backgrounds in which mimetic images of individuals were not traditional or valuable art forms. Nearly all of the foundational studies on colonial American art firmly state the dominance of portraiture, but at this time in the Americas, that really only would have been true for a very small minority of people. In a recent article on decolonization efforts in American museums, Andrew McClellan notes that our empty frame achieves inclusion only in a negative way by representing marginalized people as absent. He writes, quote, indeed, an empty frame serves as a reminder of the prevailing economic and cultural values that underpin the fine arts museum. And this is true. We were aware of these issues when we hung that frame on the wall. 
But our past attempts to come up with perfect solutions have usually resulted in stalled action. And this imperfect strategy has still opened new conversations, made some of our own struggles with our collection more transparent, and created learning opportunities for us and for our audiences. So deep are the challenges of achieving inclusion within fine arts museums, colonial artifacts that were in many ways created with the goals of exclusion, that there is no single solution, no one way to do it right. And in thinking about the multiplicity of approaches needed, and as the pandemic hit about the ways in which we would not be able to physically move, add, or remove objects, we hope to build on some of the questions raised in the empty frame label by creating new interpretation for some of the oldest, most famous works in this gallery. From organizing a 2019 exhibition on Frida Kahlo and Arte Popular, or Mexican folk art, I had learned that visitors had really interesting responses to our bilingual labels. Even people who did not read Spanish felt that they positively shaped their experience because these labels functioned visually as well as interpretively. We wondered if bringing labels in multiple languages into this gallery would enable us to confront some of the erasures in the early histories of American art and to revive some of the international journeys that these objects have taken on their way to us. The Liberty Bowl, for example, is deeply tied to patriotic histories of the United States, but where did the silver come from to make it? At this time, it was probably mined in Mexico, meaning that this object holds a Latin American history inside of it. Indigenous hands touched the raw material, and eventually it was modeled into the shape of a Chinese vessel. And from this image, you can get a sense also of what it looks like now with its multilingual labels. In developing Translating American Stories, the first initiative to bring multilingual interpretation into our permanent collection galleries, we first looked to other models, like those at the Phoenix Museum of Art, which is fully English-Spanish bilingual, and to the translation of labels into multiple indigenous languages in the groundbreaking Hearts of Our People exhibition, which Anya mentioned. But the development of our process focused tightly on where we are. In most other cities where museums have bilingual interpretation, like Phoenix or Denver, Spanish is clearly the, most, the second most spoken language after English. But in Boston, nearly as many people speak Haitian Creole and Mandarin Chinese as Spanish. And so we knew that we would need a multi rather than bilingual approach. And for me, it was also critical that the translation efforts drew on the talents of our own staff as much as possible. So often in their urgent desires for diverse perspectives, museum leaders immediately look outside of the walls of the institution, rather than at the security guards, restaurant workers, educators, IT specialists, and others from diverse backgrounds already inside the museum. So to our questions about collaboration, I'm particularly interested in internal collaboration. Instead of connecting with professional translators, we sent out a museum-wide call for participation and made clear that contributors to the project would not simply translate words that curators wrote, but join us in creating completely new content. Considering place and the ways in which Translating American Stories strives to address Boston of the past and present, we knew from the beginning that we wanted to include an indigenous language to acknowledge the long history of the land that the MFA occupies. We were initially hoping to include a label in Wopanak, the language of the Wampanoag and Massachusetts people, but learned that this is mostly a private language, spoken and written within the community. In the same way that we asked new questions about the materials and the journey of the Liberty Bowl, we also asked what would happen if, instead of focusing on Isaac Winslow, the subject of this portrait, we examine the landscape in the background that he points to. The Winslow family included generations of colonizers of Maine. Isaac Winslow's wife, Lucy Waldo, inherited, quote, the domain some 30 miles square between the Penobscot and Kennebec rivers, which is part of Wabanaki homelands. Although we do not have Wabanaki speakers on our staff at the MFA, we have long worked with Passamaquoddy educator Chris Newell, who encouraged us to reach out to Wabanaki language keeper Roger Paul. For weeks, Roger ignored my emails. He had visited the MFA in the past, seen native funerary ceramics on public view, and wanted nothing to do with us. Eventually, Chris interceded on our behalf, calling Roger and convincing him to at least meet with me and Tess over Zoom. Over the course of several hours, Roger told us how boring and lifeless this painting was. The painter, whose name is Feek, he insisted on referring to as fake. And eventually, I asked him, okay, so if your family walked into the MFA today, 
and saw this picture, what would you want them to know about it? And he said, I would want them to know that he's standing on our land. And then he added that Isaac Winslow looked like a kin chemist, someone who thinks he's in charge, but really is not. And so in drafting a new label for this painting with the knowledge that Roger shared, Tess and I knew that we needed to build it around two concepts, the land and the Kinchemis. I have so many more thoughts to share with you about this project and about working with Roger, but in the interest of time and because I think this label succinctly models our ambitions for reframing collection practices, I want to close by reading it aloud. The Wabanaki version of this text was of course written by Roger Paul, and on the MFA app, you can hear him read these labels in both English and Wabanaki. Wearing a satin waistcoat embroidered with gold foliage, Isaac Winslow dominates this composition with his stately pose and air of authority. He points to a pastel-colored vista of coastal Maine, a place where rocks and trees abruptly meet the ocean. Likely a loose representation of Pemetonic, the mountain range in the Bar Harbor area, this coastline has been home to the Wabanaki people since the birth of Turtle Island, also known today as North America. Winslow was part of a wealthy family that colonized Wabanaki homelands, and this painting, void of any native presence, perhaps even served to stake his claim. However, to the Wabanaki, Winslow would have been known as a kinchemis derived from King James, a person who has a false sense of who is in charge. Thank you so much. Should we turn up the the lights? <laughs> um, also, just uh, similar to our previous session, um, we're going to add 10 more minutes and, and conclude at 2.40 to give us time to speak. I was wondering, Mary, if you wanted to open this uh, in discussion? Sure. I'm still, like everyone in the room, probably processing these really rich presentations with so much um, uh, exciting information and also perspectives. And so I'm trying to think about ways to sort of think them together in different ways. And one of the things I was struck by in, in the presentations, and it came in different ways, was the role that a kind of inventorying played in rethinking and reframing the collections, whether that was doing some statistical analysis of the the, of the collection around certain categories such as gender or race or nationality, um, or whether it was, I was struck, Royce, in your presentation about how you showed us the, the cataloging <laughs> you know, practices that, that sort of situate and contextualize information for the public about these um, uh, ancestors. Uh, and then, of course, um, Layla, I was struck by the, you know, <laughs> something I'm very familiar with, which is the sort of the limits the, the collection places on the kinds of stories that you can tell, which also um, related to our first two presenters, thinking about how to work with collections that perhaps were built with different intentions um, and then um, rethinking them. And it seemed as though many of the rethinkings happened in the context of the 2016 and um, and uh, then of course the pandemic and that was a, a motif in, in several presentations as well. So I was um, wondering, I guess, around about that um, sort of the value uh, and the ways in which we can use inventorying practices understood in different ways um, to see the collection in ways that allow us to reframe collections. Um, that is what to talk to ask each of you to talk a little bit more about those um, of those practices. And I'm also wondering if in thinking about that question, which is pretty broad, you could also 
if you would like to invite you to kind of um, reflect on what you've learned from one another, because I was thinking about time um, and place throughout these presentations and the ways in which different ways of conceptualizing what it means to be responsible to and in relation to the place you are, um, how that manifests in um, not only the things you collect and put on display, but also the methodologies that you um, deploy and the labeling practices that you um, engage. So very open. Uh, Feel free to answer those those prompts in any way you see fit. Should we just go down the line? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I think access is wrapped up into that quite a bit. Um, and just from our discussion this morning is what are the terms that we use? What are the tags that we use in collections? How do we search them? Um, how do we integrate the multiple languages that are associated with all of these items as well as the colonial terms, the English terms, um, and where's the unity amongst those? I, I usually gravitate towards indigenous um, just because I feel Native America, Native North America, um, it constricts far too much I think there is a lot of work and consultation needed to actually up and and unsettle and rework collections and how we access them and how you know ancestral works and contemporary works are represented online. Um, I always refer back to linguistic texts and morphology and syntax, how you can really go in depth of these terms. Um, how can we translate that into material items? I also stray from using unknown makers or once known makers. If you prioritize your craft and skill to understand those items, they're not nameless. They're not unknown. We can tell a lot from those materials if you are trained to interpret them through the lens of the makers themselves. Um, and that's a challenge as well because many things are misidentified in collections. The Hiradza warrior shirt, it was classified as Assiniboine, it was classified as Lakota, until finally it was associated with Hiradza. And then is that Hiradza or Crow? At what time did this person go back and forth between our sister tribes? Um, so I think there's a lot of work to be done with that. <laughs> Sorry, can I just say one more thing? I'm just gonna gonna build on what you were saying, Royce. Like in terms of things being um, mislabeled, particularly works of indigenous art, I've been really interested in the work that Marge Bruchak has done with wampum because I think um, the way that she looks at it is she sort of refuses to look first at a curatorial file in a museum and instead has kind of just built up a way of um, comparing these objects to each other and using the sort of visual knowledge that she's built up by looking at lots of different objects. And she's explained this before as, it's not to say that there is no useful information, but that it can sort of like cloud your judgment in some ways because so often we have either partial information if not completely incorrect information. So I think the the skepticism that you are raising is a really important skill for all of us. Like even if you're looking at like a historical white artist who has been thoroughly studied, like it's a, a sort of healthy way. And I think that connects loosely to the other issue that um, I like to think about, especially with labels and how we categorize um, sort of artists and how that might help us in, in some of the um, really interesting ways that you showed, Mindy, where you had like actual like pie charts and things like that. Because I think we also can assume things about our collections unless we actually take those counts in numbers. So another example from the MFA is we recently had a exhibition that was drawn largely from our permanent collection called Women Take the Floor which was led by a colleague of mine, Noni Gadsden. And we had quite honestly always thought of our collection as being quite strong in women artists. You have like on our curatorial staff, Erica Hirschler and others who have really dedicated their careers in various ways to studying women artists. 
And once we like trotted out the data, it actually was not as impressive as we thought it was, right? It was like, it was like there were, what we learned was it was really spotty where there were like years where we had done maybe like many exhibitions or acquired many works of art. And then I think this happens a lot today where it's like, okay, cool, we did it. We like did women, like now we're gonna like move on. And so then it, it sort of falls off. And um, we're in the process of reinstalling our modern galleries. And part of the challenge there is in taking what we have learned from projects that have specifically focused on women artists or on black artists. Um, I did a project recently with one of our youth programs and like to actually sort of put these numbers um, against each other and, and also create new standards, I guess is also something. I was like extremely struck also, um, Royce, by the way that like what you were describing, how you were describing interacting with these ancestral objects was so different from what we see in like the catalog web entry. So like how do we like make those things work together better I think is an important question. And then last thing um, is that I think especially with historical artists, categories of identification are so challenging. I'm thinking specifically with maybe like LGBTQ artists who maybe were not out during their lifetimes. Like how do we reckon with that now when we want to be able to include them, but if they did not self-identify that way for a variety of reasons, like how do we sort of wrangle with that now? And is that the type of thing that we can kind of figure out ways um, to do it? Like how do we make our databases more flexible and also our labels, which is a question that came up earlier. I didn't answer anything. I just raised a bunch of questions. So I'm gonna leave that to you. <laughs> Uh, well, for me, the inventory was really helpful because I will say I used to, well, I now work at the National Museum of the American Indian, and I used to be at the National Museum of the American Indian, so I'm very aware of that collection. But when I started working for the Smithsonian American Art Museum, you know, they have a curator of photography, a curator of sculptor, a, a sculpture, time-based media, like everything is kind of divided. And the entire collection is stored together. So I was kind of confused of, what's the Renwick and what is Smithsonian American art? Like everything's stored together, so how do I know what is part of the Renwick Gallery and what is part of the SAM? And, and so it mainly came down to donors and also acquisition funds. And I did find Native American art that was in the folk art collection. So it's not in the Renwick collection, it's in the folk art collection. And that was because of the person who donated them. And also there was a purchase of some of those items as well. So that was a person who was interested in folk art. And so they get into the folk art collection. So for me, that inventory was so helpful because I was really trying to understand how the Smithsonian American Art Museum works and, and how the collection works. And so when we had that really, that data, um, and for me, it was just you know so strange because coming from the American Indian Museum, where we have so much, and then go to the Renwick, where there's only one percent Native artists in the in the collection, you know, was then sort of together. We were so excited because we're like, okay, let's see what we can do. And also at this time at the Renwick, there were three curators, and so I was one, and we were all women, and that was really exciting too because I think we really had a different way of looking at things. And we also had come from different parts of the country. And, and that was also something that I was really sort of guided towards. I really wanted to collect by living artists because I saw that some of the previous acquisitions, we didn't have information. And so it was really fr frustrating to sort of look at a work and sort of say, there's no artist birthday, place of birth. I have no idea who really this artist is. And I would have to spend a lot of time to try to look through census and online databases to try to figure out who was this person. So that's why I was really prioritizing living artists so we can get a lot of documentation down. And then also I wanted to also go and buy directly from the artist or from galleries across the United States. So sometimes you know, I saw that museums get comfortable and they have certain galleries that they go to. And I was like, well, I'm from the West Coast. So I'm going to also introduce everybody to a lot of wonderful galleries that are west of the Mississippi.
And so it was all these kind of things that to me, it was really a very exciting time because um, I could really bring my background and then see what could be acquired for the Renwick Gallery. Well, I think you've all really answered that question nicely. No. <laughs> um, one of the things I think I would say about inventories is it is useful for accountability, for reporting. I mean, we all report to boards, to other stakeholders, uh, and so it, you know, there's some usefulness in that. But it's data can be hard because it is in, it's so interpretive. It doesn't necessarily live alone. Or, I mean, we've had various requests, for example, across different departments at Crystal Bridges, asking you know, could we use that data? Could I have that data? Like, would you just share that with me? Ooh, I, you know, actually I'd like to have a conversation about it so that we can make sure that we're understanding some of the um, data points together and talking through it rather than misconstruing some of that data. And then I think of other ways of looking at the data. Have we ever looked at across the collection, um, just mentioning west of the Mississippi made me think of, how do we look at our collection in a place making or based uh, you know, analysis? But then that's so hard. This points to the difficulty of data because what if it's a, a painting by Frederick Remington, likely created in New York, of Wyoming, do we consider that Wyoming? Do we consider that New York? I would say New York, but th these uh, questions and blurriness around even reckoning with a place or a perception and you know Layla in your collection and de you know definition of America Americas where does the where do the hot spots lie is it Boston you know in in that location R right nothing from California but things from Mexico and and then what about across time? You know, how does your collection spread across time? So data is a useful tool. By no means is it, you know, foolproof or uh, even just funds. What if you map how much money you've spent on different areas of the collection? Whoa. <laughs> you know, very interesting, useful as a, a, a snapshot but maybe not as the only analysis. So thank you for all of this. It's been fantastic earlier and this panel. One of the things that struck me in the earlier panel and still I'm wondering about, when Janet and Alyssa were talking about all those thoughtful questions they asked about people coming to an exhibit, um, I kept thinking, well, for Native people, our stuff is pretty alienated from our communities, and so you're not going to have a huge community trucking across Chicago to come and see a, a museum piece from our... So it leaves me with, well, I guess most of the information is largely to educate non-Native people about those things, and that's a worthy thing. But it, would it be worthwhile now that more of our communities are building cultural centers to reach out to them, and I, <laughs> I know that, you know, Mindy, you said borrowing is not an easy thing, and, um, but I think of like some of our best materials are outside of my community, you know, I'm Mohawk community, and I love seeing work by Carla and other people from our communities, but they're not in our community, <laughs> and um, I think, um, if there, if we are to think about things like reciprocation and reciprocity and and those responsibilities, I would love to see more of an outreach to not every you know you can't do everything, but to um, community centers because as I said, we are building them in a way that they, they just weren't there before, right? And we rarely ever call them museums for all sorts of reasons, um, but I. I'm just wondering if that's part of the long-range thinking because I just keep thinking these things are so far away from us in, in many places. Thank you. You know, um, 
Scott, I think this notion of partnerships and reciprocity, how could that be a model instead of borrowing, lending, like which feels so transactional? Uh, and so what is a different model of partnering, of reciprocity, of the three R's that you mentioned, Anya, with cultural centers, with, and not, you know, just partnering with the Met or these kinds of expected places, which, um, yeah, lots, go on. Just wanted to add to that a bit is, you know, and the, the work that I do is, especially with contemporary artists, is not, and, and I'm speaking specifically indigenous artists um, who have adopted or developed over time, they're not always connected to their communities. They don't have a community engagement. So the partnerships and the networks that I really try to strive to build are with artists who are cognizant of their responsibility to their community, of being a voice extension. And so the wonderful work that I get to do is to bring artists from those communities to interact with and converse with items and collections held outside of our territories. Um, and I'm very selective of which ones I engage that long-term relationship making work with, knowing that they are going to be the miracle workers there, that they are going to bring that back and contribute and be inspired by that work and make it relevant today. Um, so I think it's, it's a much bigger question than should we just go straight to cultural centers? Should we just go straight to interpretive centers or museums, however they're called? I think we need to have a responsibility to really um, figure out what we want to lay the groundwork for, for the future. Um, because like you were saying, most of the work we're doing today is not in textbooks yet. We are not being educated to this in our MFA programs, in our curator programs. We're having to develop that. So we're in this phase of transition and really being the makers, designing what we want out of this new space um, and knowing that responsibility so that contemporary workers today, the way we cultivate that art and describe it and interact with the artists we're answering all of those questions that are unknowns with ancestral material items that we aren't left with. Well, what did they mean? Where did they source the materials? Is this a political act that we don't leave it up to interpretation, um, which is a beast to deal with? <laughs> yeah, so that's. Uh, so Scott, your question is um, very much in line because the talk I gave today was not the talk I was supposed to give. <laughs> But the pandemic, um, so that is the talk that you received today. Um, so the National Museum of the American Indian has a multi-year grant from the Margaret Cargill Foundation where it is helping with community loans. So the museum where I work has more than one million items from North, Central, and South America in its collection. And we know that there is no way that most of the people where they're their communities are represented in our collection will ever go to Washington DC or New York City where we have both you know two physical museum locations so the through the Cargill Foundation it is allowing us to then partner with tribal museums and then have pieces of their community go back and be on long term loan the the po center is was the first to do it and so I have uh, wanted my community, the Tohono O'odham Nation of Southern Arizona to also um, participate. And uh, the Tohono O'odham Nation was also one of the inaugural community exhibitions when the museum opened in Washington, DC. Um, each, you know, um, for the R People's Gallery, there were these like eight little community tribally curated pods. And then when that gallery came down, my, tribe which has its own tribal museum uh, had that display that entire exhibit go back to the community center so it's it's in Tapawa, Arizona right now and so I just thought like 
well, I'm back at National Museum of the American Indian. Uh, I really would love to have you know, more works from the collection go back um, to the, the Tribal Museum and Cultural Center. So that is something that the National Museum has been working with. And one thing I think is very amazing about the program is that it is up to the community to decide what they want to put on view. So it is not up to me to sort of say, I think you should do a basket show, or I think you should do a ceramic show. It is not based on that at all. It is up to what they want. And so, for example, there's an upcoming one, which I don't think I can talk about yet, but they actually want photographs. That instead, they look through the collection, they look through you know, um, our archives, and so instead, they want to have a photography exhibit of these works that are in our archives that document their community from the early 1900s because they really feel that that is really what they want to show the community. This is how, you know, that place looked or, oh, look, that's your great grandmother over there, you know, and so that's what I think is really kind of exciting is those kind of the ability to do something like that. So hopefully, you know, in maybe two years, um, there will be works from the National Museum of the American Indian um, in uh, Tapawa, Arizona at the Himdaki Humu uh, Huku in Bihap, or the Thon Otham Nation Cultural Center and Museum. One small comment to add to your question, Scott. Um, Marina and I have had conversations and she's very actively um, embarking on ideas for collaborating with tribal museums and community centers. And I would say that in New England, they are not full of objects either. So like that is like that's really one concern that they're they're not actually full of deep archives that we could borrow from, but they are full of deep knowledge, right? So e educators and other kind of community workers who I think are very skilled actually at teaching non-native audiences because that is what they have had to do so much of and that is also part of our responsibility at a place like the MFA. I can tell you Marina is the first person to ever walk into the MFA and say, I'm here to make exhibitions for Native people. <laughs> um, <laughs> so we'll see, you know, I, I think a shift in the ways that we serve different communities. But I keep thinking that that is also a great possibility, that it might not just be in terms of, of actual things, of objects, of works of art, um, but in terms of knowledge and presentation. And a bigger question, I think, for us in a city like Boston um, is how do we serve also like pan-indigenous communities? And I think that they can help us with that as well. All right, I, I hate this, but we have to stop. No, no, I think it's just getting going, but uh, we are on a schedule. Thank you so much. So the next, the next uh, panel begins at three o'clock.